All right, now the, uh, the topic for this talk is being and becoming. Now you may have noticed already that uh, there's a small story behind all of the, the titles and all of the topics. Yeah. Uh, because it's a big challenge to come up with new ideas. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, unless uh, I'm forced to, I just keep giving old talks over and over again. But uh, a few years ago, I was invited to a retreat uh, in Olima. Olima is part of the uh, Vedanta Society of Northern California. So they have a big uh, retreat every, I think, Memorial Day there. And the topic was Vedanta, its philosophy and mystical tradition. So I thought, how to deal with this question, philosophy on one side and mystical tradition on the other side. And then I thought Swamiji put emphasis on this particular idea of being and becoming that how being seemed to fit in nicely in this slot of philosophy and becoming in this slot of mysticism. So I, this, this was actually a talk that I gave in uh, the Olima retreat a number of years ago. The place of Vedanta is a very tricky thing. Uh, whether we call it philosophy, whether we call it religion, whether we call it a combination, whether we call it a, uh, some type of spiritual uh, tradition, it's very hard to say. At one level, uh, it's, it's philosophy, but then we treat it as our own religious tradition. Uh, on another level, uh, we can eliminate all of the ritual and everything, and we still keep the heart of Vedanta, which we find in the teachings of the Upanishads. So it, it's, it's either one or the other, or a combination, or neither, or something new like that. So uh, it's very difficult when we try to look at this in terms of uh, other spiritual traditions. Now I should say that uh, these, these retreats in Olima, they were always inter-religious. Okay, so, so there would be somebody from Christianity, or Islam, or Judaism, Buddhism, that spoke on a similar topic. So uh, I turned it into an inter-religious thing also at the same time. So I wanted to approach this, this topic uh, from a historical point of view. That means where is the place of Vedanta in the scheme of all of the different religions. So historical and interreligious point of view. Just to see how, first of all, this distinction between philosophy and mysticism, how this plays out in other religious traditions, because it's quite different. In, in some religions, the mystical side is, is considered even heretical. And, and they get persecuted even. And other traditions, they're praised and they become part of it. And some traditions, there's not much distinction that way. So I wanted to look at it from that point of view. And then I wanted to focus back on uh, Swamiji's definition of real religion, not conventional religion, real religion as being and becoming. This was his phrase. He used it at, at least nine different times. We, if we uh, do a search in the complete works. We find nine different times that he used this particular expression, which means that uh, he must have used it many, many other times uh, in uh, other talks that weren't recorded or casual conversations or something. So it was one of his uh, favorite ideas, this idea of being and becoming. It's not very clear what it means. It's a little bit uh, hazy at, at this point, but we'll try to explain. And I want to explain it in terms of the philosophical side and the mystical side. In Bhakti Yoga, in one of his lectures he says, religion is not in doctrines, in dogmas, nor in intellectual argumentation. It is being and becoming, it is realization. Then another lecture, Claims of Religion, he says, stand up and reason out, having no blind faith. Religion is a question of being and becoming, not of believing. Yeah. This is religion, and when you have attained to that, you have religion. Now, the reason that I find this phrase uh, being and becoming so appropriate for this topic of philosophy and mystical traditions is that uh, the philosopher seems to want to come up with some fixed conception of, of reality, which we could say is being. And the mystic is more concerned with transformation and change, which we can say is, is becoming. The whole history of Western philosophy, 
goes back to two different schools. And then in the ancient Greeks, uh, there was one, Parmenides was his name, that everything being is, not being is not. Very kind of strict, uh, we can almost say conventional and even conservative type of idea. And then the other was everything is changing. This uh, becomes more of a Buddhist type of thing, transitory, the flow of the river, all of that. And really two different schools have come in, in all of Western philosophy that can be traced back to these two. Uh, but anyhow, even, even the philosophical schools that talk about everything as flux, everything is changing, this is a kind of fixed position. That, uh, so even this falls within the philosophy and within this idea of, of being. Now the mystic is always interested in transformation. And this transformation is, is in our own understanding and our own purity. Uh, even in our, our own conceptions will change a little bit. Uh, it may come into this realm of, of grace, this realm of, of course, of direct experience, this realm of some type of uh, mystical union, uh, something which falls clearly within this idea of becoming. Because uh, we attain to a state which we do not presently have. It may be there potentially, but now our understanding of things is, uh, is something that we'll, we know will undergo change. Uh, our feeling of relationship with God may change. Uh, we may enter into some state of union that we don't have now. So uh, everything has to do with this idea of becoming. So Swamiji's statement is... is Wonderful in the sense that uh, it takes both together. It shows the importance of some metaphysical uh, understanding of, of the universe and of ourselves and of God, and also practice. So we can say it's theory and practice together is in being and, and becoming. And this, this is what uh, we need. We need both sides of these things, even though uh, the mystical side will trump the philosophical side. And experience is always greater than theory. This is this will be the conclusion that we have in almost all of the well, we can say mystical traditions. Now, is Vedanta a mystical tradition? It, of course, it's both. But ultimately, the way Sri Ramakrishna teaches it, I would say yes, because everything is God realization. This is the this is the ultimate goal and the ultimate proof of everything, direct experience. So, in that sense, it is a kind of mystical tradition. Now, what do we mean? We're throwing around a lot of terms here. What exactly do we mean when we talk about a mystical tradition or mysticism, uh, especially as opposed to a philosophical or a conventional side of religion or a theoretical side of religion? Uh, in general, this has to do with the experience of the individual adherent of, of any particular religion, the experience of some type of communion with God, or some type of vision, or some type of experience of a higher reality, or some type of very deep insight. Say the Buddhist, the, the Buddha himself, it wasn't exactly union with God or communion, but he had some flash of insight, which we call enlightenment, nirvana. So any of these things where the mind is no longer functioning on its ordinary plane, where we may not even see things, that the mind will be raised to a higher level, and some experience will come that is transformative, that it's not simply at that moment that we have it, when we come down from it, we find that we're different, that we're changed. This is the test of it. Uh, in Mundaka Upanishad, we find that the three different tests, all of the knots of the heart are untied, all of the doubts are destroyed, and all of our seeds of the karma get burned. So that they can't be planted and they can't lead to any future birth. So there are different tests for all of these things. The mystical traditions of the world generally, uh, generally we find within them that this, this mystical experience is only for a rare few. That it may be open to everyone but it's not experienced by everyone and not everyone likes it or wants it or cares about it. It's, it's really for... The, the mad people, and very often they're portrayed as, as madmen, those who have these types of uh, experience. Uh, very often it's attributed to a special type of grace, 
that without that grace that God somehow chooses. Somehow, and it may be a very arbitrary thing, it may be uh, what they call a hetuki, that there's no motive behind it, no rationale behind it, why one person gets it and another person doesn't get it. These are all ideas uh, about grace. Or it comes from some tremendous longing for God, bakulata. This is Taku's favorite word. This is bakulata. Sometimes uh, we even see that uh, he used it so much that uh, his, his teaching can be called Vyakulata Yoga, the path of, of longing for God, tremendous, such tremendous longing that there's a feeling of agony, that we're ready to kill ourselves even, unless we can realize God. This is that real Vyakulata. So we find that those who have this mystical experience, they enter into some type of ecstatic state, or trance-like, state or altered state of mind and they can experience things which they can't express. That even coming down from there they won't be able to give any logical explanation uh, but they know that they've had something real. We, we may question is it imagination or not, they can't question it. That it has that, that stamp of, of realness to them. Uh, it may be through intense spiritual practice. Those who do long hours of meditation uh, long hours of, of prayer. Sri Ramakrishna, uh, his first uh, sadhana, if we want to call it that, uh, wasn't so much the meditation that we <coughs> used to sit quietly for meditation, but it was this, uh, this intense longing and, and crying for a Divine Mother. It would become so intense that he would end up sometimes that he would go into a state where he was unmoving. It would look like he's uh, lost it. Uh, near a couple samadhi or something, but within the heart is still longing and pounding for, for God realization. Uh, some traditions we find that uh, even the singing and dancing and in, in this, this whole idea of kirtan and the uh, Sufi school that followed the uh, great Sufi uh, writer Rumi, this, uh, the school that followed him was all about these, what we call these whirling dervishes. They would dance and spin and spin, and, and through that somehow the mind would, would be raised to a higher level. They would have some type of ecstatic experience. Or it could be through an intense austerity. The Desert Fathers, in the early days of Christianity, and the area around Egypt and everything, long periods of solitude and fasting and, and prayer and everything would somehow raise the mind to some type of higher level. Now the interesting thing about these mystical traditions is that uh, they are so different in, in the forms that they take and yet the realization is a hundred percent universal. That those who have these mystical experiences, if you put them all in a room together, they won't have any quarrels. Sri Ramakrishna says how the jackals, they all howl alike. <laughs> Every jackal, they'll be able to understand them. So these mystics, they speak the same language. It's, it's in the lower stages, the very conventional side of religion, that everyone will quarrel. But those who have these, these very high experiences, they belong to a different class. They'll all understand each other. If we get them all together in a room, they'll have a nice time. They'll have a big party together. Uh, explaining all of their experiences and everything. So we find that there's a certain universality that regardless of the external trappings of the religion, the names and the forms and the different rituals and all of that, that they reach a level where uh, they're all on the same page. They all seem to understand each other. If we look at the religions that all grew out of the Middle East, out of uh, uh, the Israel Judaism first, then Christianity, then Islam, we see that they all had at different periods very vigorous mystical traditions. Uh, in Judaism for many centuries, this Hasidic and uh, Kabbalistic movement where uh, they also did this, this ecstatic dance and singing and and would have very high experiences in God realization. I, I'm reading now a book on uh, the Baal Shem Tov. He was the founder of the Hasidic movement. 
I'm reading it as if I'm reading Sri Ramakrishna. He's talking to God, he's, he's going into the mystical states, all of these things. These things that, uh, and so similar, the similarities are the things that are the most amazing, even though the tradition may be very different. So we have that. Christian mystics, uh, who were mostly these monks and nuns, who practiced long hours of solitude and prayer, who would have these tremendous visions, usually visions of Christ. Sometimes it was so strong, they'd meditate, they would meditate so deeply on Christ on the cross, that they would get that bleeding from their own hands and feet. This is the power of the mind to so deeply delve into something that we experience that, that oneness. This is one of, one of the ideas of meditation, that we take on the, uh, the very essence of the object of our meditation. We become transformed. So we see it there. And then uh, the Sufi tradition within uh, Islam, we, we've seen that for uh, so many hundreds of years, there have been those who uh, operated a little bit outside of society. Sometimes they weren't accepted, sometimes they were considered uh, heretics. Uh, but they were also very universal in their teaching. If you read, especially the Sufi tradition in India, it's Vedanta. You won't find any, any difference whatsoever. And so they were very open and liberal. So we can see that uh, in some of these traditions, uh, the, the relationship was not a, a very easy type of relationship. Many of the Christian saints were stuck in dungeons. The St. John of the Cross, they were ready to, to excommunicate him and, and send him to, uh, to Mexico. Spain had just uh, you know, conquered Mexico and, and uh, uh, they were ready to send him there. They thought that uh, his experiences were so far outside of what they understood from the church that they uh, thought he was some type of a heretic. Uh, in uh, the Sufi tradition, uh, we find both. Say this, uh, I mentioned Rumi, Jaladadin Rumi. He was considered uh, one of the great saints of the tradition during his lifetime. Others were, were persecuted and, and considered kafir. They were considered to be unholy and uh, even killed. Uh, so we, we find uh, this, this very uneasy relationship sometimes between uh, the mystical tradition and the conventional side of religion uh, in the three religions of the West, we can say. But still, there were periods when, uh, especially, say, 13th to the 16th centuries, this golden age of the Sufi, where uh, this was the Sufis were the kings, where they, they were the real innovators and they were the ones that were respected. Uh, and now we reach a stage where some of them are, are outlawed, some are considered. So it changes, it goes back and forth that way. Uh, there was a period of uh, almost the same time in Judaism when this mystical tradition was almost universally accepted, uh, which included belief in reincarnation and belief in that God can be experienced directly. Uh, many things which uh, are so outside of what we think of as, as the uh, standard uh, conventional side of these different of religions. Now, what about Vedanta? First of all, it's hard to compare Vedanta to all of these other religions because uh, maybe it's better to t speak about Hinduism. Because Vedanta itself uh, isn't on the same footing. Vedanta exists very nicely without any ritual, uh, without any of the mythology and all of that. If we simply have our Tattvamasi and we have our Upanishads, we, it's enough. What we consider the Vedantic tradition, now Vedanta uh, almost fulfills the role of its own religion. We can almost say that one of the, one of the sects within Hinduism is the Ramakrishna uh, Vedanta, some, somehow, because uh, we have our own ritual that's come up, uh, we have our, our own uh, founder, our own personalities and all of that, so it's kind of taken the form of its own religion without losing the universal aspect of it, and the mystical aspect of it. But, even if we, if we just speak of Hinduism, now we find in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, all of these, the relationship between the conventional and the mystical uh, is, is uh, no longer antagonistic in any way. We don't find any period where the yogis were persecuted, or any of the, the mystics and the 
saints and everything, who are always looked upon as the ultimate goal, to have some type of a mystical experience. And uh, even, uh, even those who were considered to be mad were somehow looked upon. See, Sri Ramakrishna looked upon with great respect. It was understood that it was a spiritual type of madness. Or Bhagavad Thakur. Right? He used to be called that, that, yeah, that mad Brahmin, they would say, of Dakshineshwar. But everyone knew that it was a type of, not everyone, but we understand it as a type of divine madness. Now we know at the time there were people who thought he was simply crazy, even his own family members. They, that's why they wanted to get him married and, and all of that. But and generally it was understood that uh, these, these great souls would sometimes act as if they were mad. We have these different pishachi, but they would appear like a ghoul or like a madman or like a child or like an inert object. We have all of these different types of things here. So within, if we want to talk about Hinduism, within Hinduism, one of, one of the very standard conventional ways of, of worshipping within Hinduism is worshipping Shiva. Now what, who is this Shiva? From the Puranic point of view, he's a perfect madman who, who lives in a cremation ground, who smears his body with ashes, isn't interested in anything, half the time he's lost in meditation, Otherwise, he's singing and dancing, repeating the name of Rama. So this is held up as, as the very high ideal, which is also the, the mystical ideal. And those who renounce the world, the Shiva is some, some, on some level, of course, they're Vaishnava Satus, but some level he's the presiding deity of monks. He's the ideal for, for monks, uh, that perfect freedom, that indifference, that uh, uh, love of, of solitude, and the uh, love of death, Sri Ramakrishna uh, says that, Swamiji says, to, he who hugs the form of death, to him the mother comes. Sri Ramakrishna also says, one should constantly think of death, that will bring that dispassion, and that longing for something higher. So, uh, we find that the uh, theological or philosophical or metaf metaphysical teachings of Hinduism or, or Vedanta, coexist very nicely with the mystical side and go hand in hand, sometimes are indistinguishable. So this theory and practice go together. This is why Swamiji says being and becoming. He doesn't say of one or the other. Uh, he doesn't say somehow we have to harmonize the two or get rid of the uh, contradictions there. Uh, for him, they work very nicely together, this being and becoming. So this is mystical side. What about the philosophical side? Now we have to look at uh, the with, within Vedanta, this philosophical side, because uh, it won't always follow these very same universal ideas that the mystical side does. And uh, we have to be very clear when we talk about the philosophical side of of the Hindu tradition, we're not talking about the Upanishads and Gita, because the Upanishads and Gita are full of mystical ideas. There, and I, I've mentioned it many times that I read the Upanishads as poetry, full of allegory and everything, and, and full of this hint that truth cannot be realized through the mind, that we have to transcend it. The philosophical period in Hinduism is different. It is when we get to Shankaracharya and Ramanuju and Vatva and all of, all of the other great Acharyas. And here we find that uh, they like to quarrel. They like to try to assert their position and oh, yeah. disprove the others. So it's a long tradition of, of philosophical disputation. And uh, where uh, Shankaracharya, for example, will insist that uh, uh, any dualistic position will end in some type of contradiction and that uh, as much as you talk about devotion and karma yoga and all of that, nothing can remove ignorance except knowledge. So the jnana yoga is superior to all of the others. Then you'll have matva and some others will say, no, the bhakti yoga is superior. That is blasphemy to say that I am one with God. So they'll, they'll fight each other and quarrel and try to prove who's right and, and who's wrong. Now, I don't want to be too critical 
and uh, Swamiji himself, uh, while he was a little critical, he would say all of the Acharyas, they had to twist the text to show that I, they were really saying what they wanted it to say. Still, he had the highest regard for the Acharyas, especially Shankaracharya. He's, but if we look at, it's an interesting, Swamiji's attitude towards Shankaracharya and his attitude to the Buddha. We can say Buddha represents the mystical side and, and uh, Shankaracharya the philosophical side. Uh, he had the highest regard for, for the intellect of Shankaracharya, but a higher regard for the heart of Buddha. Yes. And he always used to say the ideal man is, is the one who has the intellect of a Shankaracharya and the heart of the Buddha. But he always preferred the heart over the other. And he never quite forgave Shankaracharya for this Adhikaravada, that uh, he wasn't willing to uh, admit or to allow uh, people, regardless of caste, regardless of sex, regardless of uh, country or anything, to have access to the highest truths of the Vedas. He, he represented the orthodoxy a little bit. Whereas the Buddha's whole thing was to let everyone have access. That he was a real iconoclast that way. So this is uh, what we find with these, these great Acharyas. Of course, they weren't simply philosophers. It's very interesting that we to know that they were all sadhus. They all renounced the world. Yeah. Right? So, so, so that meant that, that they also had uh, this tremendous dispassion and this tremendous longing for some type of realization. Shankaracharya, he did so much for India at the time when it was really uh, losing all of its cultural bearings and religious bearings. He reestablished the whole system of temple worship, the whole system of, of monasticism. He, uh, he re-established the importance of the Vedas. His commentary on Gita was so important that for, for some centuries people thought he was the author of Gita. Incredible, yeah. So we can't downplay what he did. At the same time, uh, when we get to uh, those who we can say uh, liked the mystical side more, even though, of course, Shankaracharya recognized all of this, that, Brahman is beyond mind and thought, but uh, we will get to Swamiji, we'll get to Sri Ramakrishna, and we'll see that uh, they had this uh, understanding that the differences of the philosophical schools were not ultimate differences. They were all about harmony and oneness. And uh, you'll never see Sri Ramakrishna arguing against any other philosophy or any other religion trying to say, no, this is true, that's wrong, this is the flaw in that, this is the fault here. You'll never ever find that. So, uh, we find that uh, this one basic distinction is there, that the uh, philosophers were intent on establishing their own philosophical position on the highest level of rationality, and which would not allow uh, much space for the others. In fact, it was the tradition that uh, if you had a debate between you know, two different acharyas, which if one won, then the other, all of his disciples, they had to all uh, accept the position of the one that they lost to. So it was felt that a lot of these debates were the, the cause of, uh, of Buddhism not prevailing in India, and also Sankhya's system. That way, the Shankaracharya system uh, had, uh, was the most rational. And somehow it established uh, the, the truth of, of non-dualism, even though uh, most of India is more comfortable with the dualistic system. Uh, but uh, we should also remember, say Ramanuja, that he also had a tremendous heart. And uh, Swamiji and others, Swami Ramakrishnananda, he wrote a whole thing about Ramanuja, that uh, they always point to that story where uh, when he took uh, initiation to receive mantra, he asked his Guru Dev, his Guru Dev said, don't tell it to anybody. He said, what will happen? He said, whoever hears this mantra will get liberation, but you'll go to hell for <laughs> revealing this. So what did he do? He started telling everybody. <laughs> yeah, he said, I don't mind going to hell if so many others will get liberated. So he also had a tremendous heart. So these things are never so 
you know, black and white. There's always a little big gray area there. I'm skipping over a few things. It's okay, because the time and also we have a little more chance for, uh, for questions and things afterwards. It's very interesting. Keep on talking. Keep on talking, please. Now I want to get to uh, go back to this uh, mystical side and, and how we can, uh, because what we want to do is, is somehow see how the philosophical side and, and the mystical side don't have to be contradictory, but how they can uh, work together. And uh, Swamiji really uh, was was the one who, who understood this. this. That's why this being becoming he used it so often. Uh, some of the uh, great sayings that Swamiji made uh, that deal with both of these things can be a little confusing sometimes. I always used to, to uh, wonder why Swamiji said each soul is potentially divine. This was one of his most famous statements. I'll read the whole thing. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within by controlling nature, external and internal. Do this either by work or worship or psychic control or philosophy, by one or more of all of these and be free. This is the whole of religion. Right? This is the whole of religion. Doctrines or dogmas or rituals or books or temples or forms are but secondary details. Now, Swamiji's whole point, the whole point of Vedanta, is that right now, this very moment, we're perfect, we're divine, we're free. But why does he say potentially divine? I used to wonder about that. It goes exactly back to this idea, from the point of being, we're perfect already. From the point of becoming, uh, we're not perfect. We're uh, completely identified with his body and mind, and his mind is full of... of Thomas and Rajas, and uh, we have to purify it, we have to do so much, we have to cleanse the heart, and we have to uh, free ourselves from bondage and attachment. This is all within the realm of becoming, transformation, yes. change. Yeah. So from a very practical point of view, uh, we're, we're divine, only theoretically, but uh, we're uh, very much human, and we're very much bound, and we're very much tied to this body idea. Uh, and very much attached to the world, uh, which is contrary to our true nature. So this is the whole point, this, this gap that we find uh, between reality and experience. From the point of view of being, we're already perfect. From the point of view of experience, uh, we're very much bound to the world and very much potentially able to attain that state of perfect purity and perfect freedom and perfect oneness. Why are we perfectly capable of attaining it? Because it's already true. If we had to establish something that wasn't true, we couldn't do it. This is one of the basic ideas of, of Vedanta, that why is it inevitable that I will realize that my oneness with Brahman? Because I'm already one with Brahman. If I had to establish it, I couldn't do it. If we start out with two, we can never get to one. If that two is, is merely apparent, and there's no reality to it, that the real truth is oneness, then it's inevitable. Then we all have to realize our oneness. This is one of the very basic ideas uh, of, of Vedanta. So, uh, it's, there's a gap. And there's a gap, is the gap between being and becoming, that we have to undergo a certain type of transformation uh, in order to realize that what we're seeking we already have. It's a tremendous contradiction, or paradox, not contradiction. Paradox is a seeming contradiction. So this is the great paradox of spiritual life, yeah. that at the end of the journey, we find ourselves standing at the very beginning. And yet, uh, unless we go through, Thakur says they had board games in those days, mm -hmm. like Monopoly and things that we have now, that uh, uh, unless you go through every square, you can't reach the end. Where's the end? It's at the beginning, the same thing.
I don't know how many of you are, are familiar enough with the, the American sports. Which one? Football and baseball. Not basketball. Baseball. Not basketball. <laughs> okay, football baseball, and baseball. Baseball, but you go other things that come back. Okay. Yeah. Football, you start at one side and you end up yeah. in the other. Mm -hmm. This is a tr very traditional, non-mystical, uh, conventional Western type of religious idea. We start here. This is who we are. And then we want to go someplace else to heaven. In, in baseball, uh, you go all the way around and you end up exactly where you started, but you can, and then, then you get one run. You, you step on home plate, you get one. If you go to, to, to bat and you step on home plate and say, I scored. <laughs> yes. No, they say no. It's okay to end up there, but you, it won't count unless you go to first base, second base, third base, and then come home. Right. <laughs> so this is, this is what God realization is. How we score mm -hmm. and, and, and without the home run. The home run, that we end up where we started. We end up really realizing that I was already where I needed to be, already perfect. That way. But it doesn't count. We have to we have to go through the whole journey and realize that what we were seeking uh, is is already within us. That we're already perfect. We're already there. So this is uh, uh, that idea of. Uh, uh, the becoming aspect is going around. The being aspect is that we're already where we'll, we'll, where we'll be when we end up. It's just a question of get rid of it, getting rid of that gap that exists between our understanding and our realization. Now, one of the essential features of this mystical tradition is that it requires a super rational state of mind. That means that the, the mind, present mind that we have, which is a logical mind, which uh, stays within the realm of time, space, and, and causation, uh, which understands things in, in terms of, uh, of, of linear time, all, all of these things, that that mind can take us only so far. This is something understood by the Upanishads. Through the Upanishads, we have the very famous line, Yato vacho nevatante. That uh, this, the, what is the definition of, of the Brahman? Brahman is that, and it doesn't say anything what it is, that indefinable reality from which the mind, together with speech, from which they return, unsuccessful. They haven't been able to realize it. Sometimes they say return baffled. So the mind and speech, they try to realize the true nature of, of the Brahman. It can be done, because as long as we, uh, as the mind is functioning, we have some feeling of I. As long as that feeling of ego is there, uh, we there's no oneness between this ego and this ultimate reality. This ego has to disappear. The ego disappears when the mind stops functioning. The ego is nothing but an idea. This is one of the great teachings of, of Vedanta. Uh, the Sankhya system will say this the ego hankara is a structure within consciousness. This is the antakarana, they have before the chitta, buddhi, hankara, manas. These are all different aspects of, of conscious life. But the Vedanta will say that no, we have to understand ego in terms of false identification. Then whatever, and it's really a, a very Western Freudian almost idea that this ego means self image. Whatever I take myself to be, whatever I think, when I use the word I, what does it refer to? So it refers to my understanding of who, who I am. It's just an idea. I am not, I am, if it's an idea, then it's an object of consciousness, and I'm something separate from that. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so Swamiji will explain that, that the Brahman is beyond time, space, and causation. This is one of the ways uh, he defines Mahaya. What is Maya? Time, space, and causation. He has a whole beautiful section on the meaning of Maya. Sometimes he says it's just a statement of fact. That this is just the way things are. Why, why is this world like this? We can't say. This is Maya. Just, uh, we don't know why or how inscrutable the things are the way that they are. So, the mind functions only in relative terms. And you know who understood this best? Einstein. Oh. Yes. He used to say that uh, we can understand absolutely everything about the way things work, phenomena. Now that Adam words in it, we won't have the slightest idea of what that 
transcendent reality is that it goes beyond all of these things. So we're within the realm of phenomena, how, how one thing affects another and all of that. Uh, ultimate causes will go beyond the realm of the mind. Because we're trying to realize that which is beyond time and space, and which is uncaused, so beyond those three. So, uh, so Swamiji, he had this idea that the highest truth is beyond reason but will never contradict reason. So we shouldn't just accept something that doesn't make any sense and say, oh, it's a mystical thing. It shouldn't contradict reason, but it will transcend the, the realm of the mind. And at the same time, while he understood this whole mystical thing, he didn't like the magical thing. He didn't like the, the uh, mystery mongering. He didn't like any superstitious things. He wrote in one of his letters that don't even touch with your little toe any of these, these uh, strange, mysterious things, uh, these special powers and special experiences and things, and Mahatmas and all that. He didn't care for any of that type of stuff, but he understood the real mystical experiences going beyond mind that way. Now, who was the greatest representative of this mystical side of spiritual life? Sri Ramakrishna. Right. The whole life he lived in that realm. Yeah. He lived. He lived in a realm we can't imagine. That uh, constantly in communion with the Divine Mother and having all types of experiences and everything. Uh, we shouldn't think because of this that somehow he didn't have a very sharp intellect. My personal feeling is that uh, even Swamiji's mind couldn't touch Sri Ramakrishna's mind. Yes. And his ability to, to understand subtle truth, his ability to explain things, because it was all based on his own experience. But his clarity of vision was so tremendous. His ability to explain subtle things and, and with these little parables and everything is just tremendous. I don't think we can find another person. Forget about Shankaracharya, Ramanuja, Madhva, any of them that had the intellect that Sri Ramakrishna had, and yet he didn't care for it. He utilized it to help explain things, but everything was uh, experienced with him. But the, in the realm of ideas, uh, he could just uh, come up with these incredible analogies and parables. He could play with ideas, like children play with toys, uh, or like a sculptor will mold clay. He, could, uh, he had that facility. His mind was so fluid and so free and so, uh, so subtle, uh, because everything was based on his own experience. If, if we try to uh, imagine something and try to think of something, uh, every chance that we'll get confused or we'll uh, think of one thing instead of another thing. If we've actually been someplace and we have to describe it, remember it, then it is easy. Uh, we'll never contradict ourselves. Say somebody's writing a novel. Mm. One of the problems with a novel is, is flaws. That they end up putting some, place, some person in two places at the same time, or somebody who's supposed to be the son ends up the father, and it, because we have to keep everything straight in our mind. But if we're simply remembering something that took place in the past that we experienced, there can't be a contradiction. Mm -hmm. right. So this was Sri Ramakrishna, that everything was uh, right there in front of him. He had experienced all of these very subtle things. So despite his brilliant mind and the ability to explain things, everything, was the focus was all on realization, transformation, illumination, attainment of the highest uh, wisdom, of the highest joy, of the highest bliss of Brahman, finding that hidden treasure within the heart. He always spoke about things like that. Uh, so we see uh, that his attitude towards everything was completely different from the attitude of the uh, Acharyas, because he didn't find any contradiction between the different philosophical systems and what's more important is he didn't place the same emphasis. He didn't, his understanding of truth was so different. Truth to him did not mean uh, any type of explanation, any type of verbalization of, of anything. Truth to him was experience, the experience of something, of Brahman. This was the ultimate truth. Say we have an individual and we want to describe that individual. Ten people, they'll give a different description. 
Now, will we say that one is right and one is wrong? Uh, no one can fully, des a description is a limitation, by definition. Because with the, we're leaving things out. Right. What is the truth of the person, the person? <coughs> what is the only thing that contains everything, that person? So, Swami Swamiji, he used to say that, that the child sees only the mother, the husband sees only the wife, that the student sees only the teacher there. But if you call that person over, does only the wife come? If it's the husband, or only the teacher of the student, the whole person comes. So the truth is, is the person. The truth is the Brahman itself is the truth. So Sri Ramakrishna had this theory that uh, all of these different schools, from the dualist to the qualified dualist to the non-dualist, that uh, these were just different, uh, different models, different attitudes, different understandings that were all helpful for different people. Uh, generally, when we hear Thakur's very famous statement, generally this is interpreted to refer to all the different religions of the world, that all, all, as many faiths, so many paths. But it equally applies to as many philosophies, so many paths. All of these are matas. That even in, in the philosophical tradition of, of India, they're considered to be a mata. Mata means a point of view, an opinion. It doesn't mean truth. Yes? So, uh, what distinguishes Sri Ramakrishna and some of the enlightened souls is the fact that they've experienced or perceived Brahman. How does theoretical knowledge, does theoretical knowledge help? And if so, how? Theoretical knowledge uh, leads to conviction. We, we, have to, we have to be convinced first that something is true. Now, it may come just by seeing uh, a god realized soul. Mm -hmm. Or it may come through, we read something and we say, yes, this, finally I've read something that makes sense to me, that I can't see any flaws in this thing. <clears throat> but uh, it has to be realized. So there are different, there's a definite value to it. <coughs> Even this vichara, what they call vichara, where we constantly analyze things. The... The vichara does not lead to realization, but it will, it will get rid of all false ideas. This is, this is what is said in the scriptures, that uh, once we eliminate all false ideas, so this is a process of nati nati. We've eliminated, we know that Brahman can't be this, can't be that, that the real self can't be the mind, it can't be the sense. Once we've eliminated everything, then we're ready to have that direct experience. I, I guess the follow-up to the question of the mind has its uh, natural inclination to fall back into Ajna. Into ajna. It, it relapses back into its state of ignorance. And so, how is this whole vicious cycle resolved? Because you know, you'll have the theoretical knowledge one day, and then you wake up the next day, it goes back to, oh, why don't I have this, why don't I have that? The, the relative, the relative yes. of this is this is the, uh, the role of practice. They call it piyasa. This is the role of practice. We have to, as soon as the mind falls back into the old position, we have to pull it again. We have to say no. You remember you got in trouble. You thought like that, and it led only to bondage and unhappiness. And, and uh, we reinforce this through meditation and through spiritual practice, and keeping holy company, going into solitude, all of our spiritual practices are meant for that. So we have to believe in transformation. We, we shouldn't think that the mind will automatically keep going back to the old position. We have to believe that gradually, through practice, it will change. Our understanding will, will change. Now, uh, will it keep changing to the point where it, it becomes perfect? No. It'll keep changing to the point where we're ready for some breakthrough. That's what that's what we hope will happen. Something like that. So for for Sri Ramakrishna, uh, this Jatamata the part it refers to all. So what is the value of, of this non-dualistic position? Not that that will say, well, this is the absolute truth, but that this is something that uh, works for me. This is a model that I can use to go through that I like looking at the room from sitting here and not from sitting there. I know that wherever you sit, you're seeing the same room. That way it doesn't matter that way. I won't quarrel with anybody else, uh, but I, I like this. Sri Ramakrishna used to talk about the two factors. One, ruchi bheda, that we all have different tastes. If one person likes, uh, he would say to the mother, 
cooks fish for her children. The one she knows that likes it is uh, this uh, fish stew, one likes fried fish, everything. She knows which one, who likes what. So she'll make it for each one. But there's also this Bhajam Shakti. The power of digestion is different. Oh, yeah. So if somebody likes the fried food. Last night I had this, these fried uh, <laughs> choli bhatore. So of course I had indigestion through the night. So uh, the Ruchi Veda is there. I liked it very much. But I'm not qualified to have it late at night. <laughs> so these are the two things that we find in a spiritual path. And so this philosophical uh, truth for the philosopher is just a, a spiritual path for the devotee. We find one that's, that suits us, and then we can, we can follow that, and we can combine them. And just as we can combine the different yogas, we can be dualists at some times and non-dualists at other times without any contradiction. And the, the best example and illustration of this is something that Sri Ramakrishna liked very much, and this is our Hanuman's statement to Brahma. We have this beautiful verse. Uh, Brahma asks Hanuman, how do you look upon me? And he says, Deha buddhya sudhasoham. When I have this feeling that I am this body, then I am your servant. Then, jiva buddhya tvad angshaka. When I think I'm a jiva, then I'm a part of you. And then, atma buddhya tvameva aham. When I think of myself as the Atman, you and I are one and the same. Iti me nishtita matihi. This is my final, most mature opinion. So it depends on our, our state of mind. Not, not stuck with this idea that dualism is true, and I'll be this, take this attitude. It's a, everything is attitude. Moni ekota. Thakur used this expression, everything is the, is the mind. So he used to say, this jaman bhav tem nila. As is our attitude, so is our gain. So it's a question not of is it true or is it not true. Everything is true if it's helpful. And nothing is true if we're talking about the absolute ultimate truth. Yes, right. It is truth that comes from the experience. But we have to utilize these things. So these quarrels for Sri Ramakrishna between the dualist and non dualist I mean, these were silly for him. And Swamiji also. Now the second theory that they had was that one leads to the other that the dualist, the truth of the dualism can be uh, seen as somehow accepted by the qualified non-dualist. The qualified non-dualist can see the truth of dualism, but the dualist can't see anything above. The, the non-dualist can accept the truth of the others, that somehow one, one can lead to the other, one is subsumed by the other. The non-dualist can see everything from the Vyavaharika point of view from, uh, and, and explain things from a dualistic point of view that way but ultimately it will be subsumed under this idea of uh, non-dualism. So Sri Ramakrishna used to say that everything ends in oneness and Swamiji liked this idea of these three schools so much that uh, he wanted to write a whole book about it. When he, he was in the United States he wrote back to his uh, to the Madrasi disciples asking them to send the commentaries on uh, Madhuva, Ramanaji and Shankaracharya. He wanted to do this thing to, to show how there was no ultimate contradiction, but one led to the other, and, and finally the non-dualism was the highest. But the whole point is that if, if we're suited to a devotional point of view, if we have the heart of a devotee, and we don't care about philosophy, I want to feel that I lie in the lap of mother and that this is what will take me to the highest type of realization. Then what, what do we care about philosophy? This is how the, the mystic thinks, the devotee thinks, that uh, uh, they won't bother with arguing whether dualism is true or non dualism is true. Now, the very final, uh, the very final way of understanding all of this uh, is that these different stages, different philosophies represent different levels of the mind according to this idea of Kundalini. Sri Ramakrishna used to say when, when the mind rises to a higher state we have different experiences, we see the world differently. We can see the great rises to a certain state, we can see everything is light. And then in a higher state we start to merge and everything seems to disappear. So uh, he used to say that 
uh, going up, this spiritual power going up, it's also like us climbing to the roof. We, we get higher and higher, we leave things below. When we get to the roof, we have a certain type of experience. And uh, this is what he calls that uh, highest type of, of perfect knowledge, jnana, where there's only oneness, where we're merged, when everything Shankaracharya will say about this world being unreal and disappearing and there's no longer a snake, only the rope, everything is perfectly true at that state. And Sri Ramakrishna experienced that uh, when he describes some of his different visions uh, and Swamiji also. The first thing they say is that everything started to swirl around and disappear and this whole visible universe seemed to be gone. Anyway, only consciousness exists at that time. But Sri Ramakrishna did not stop there. He said that when the mind comes down again, then that transformation has taken place. We see everything as the manifestation of this divine consciousness, manifestation of mother, and then all sorts of mystical things happen. He says there one can talk to God. One can have the vision of God. We don't understand these, these, these are things that are strictly for uh, the, the mystic. That unless we have these under the experiences, we won't understand. All right, now I'll, we'll close here. I want to read a quote from Swamiji's lecture on the ideal of a universal religion. Lastly, it is imperative that all these various yogas should be carried out in practice. Mere theories about them will not do any good. First, we have to hear about them, then we have to think about them. We have to reason the thoughts out, impress them on our minds, and we have to meditate on them, realize them, until at last they become our whole life. No longer will religion remain a bundle of ideas or theories, nor an intellectual ascent. It will enter into our very self. By means of intellectual ascent, we may today subscribe to many foolish things and change our minds altogether tomorrow. But true religion never changes. Religion is realization. Not talk, nor doctrines, nor theories, however beautiful they may be. It is being and becoming. Not hearing or acknowledging. It is the whole soul being changed into what it believes. That is religion. Thank you. This is a beautiful... It's okay. Well, it's... <laughs> from the message given by Swamiji, mm. that is, theoretically we are perfect. There is divinity in us. To okay. realize our true nature, mm. that is the whole purpose of religion. Yes. And the secondary thing is going to the temples, worshiping, they are all secondary. This yes. is the primary. Yes. So what happens practically? We hear from you, we hear from many monks who give several lectures and we read Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, everything else. When we enter the world, hatred, jealousy, fraud, all types of, what shall I say, uh, hypocritical things take hold of us. Mm. And from what I understand from you, to get liberated from all these hypocritical actions, mm. abhyas, Yes. Like meditation, living in the company of holy men, yes. and prayers yes. will help to cleanse all these activities. Yes. Then that is the part of becoming a religion, real religion, or going to temples is not the solution for it. When we say that uh, something is secondary, yeah. that doesn't mean that it's not important. Mm -hmm. Yes. It doesn't mean it's not important. We have to understand the role that it plays, that's all. We shouldn't think that that's the beginning and end the computer. But we have to understand that uh, for many people, it's not, a, not only helpful, but almost essential. Some type of... Uh, because the mind, the more the mind is, is engaged in religious things or spiritual things, the less it's thinking about other things. The mind is being raised to a higher level. So even ritual, uh, we do the puja. This puja is something tremendous. Those who do puja every day, and it really is an important thing for them, they may even grow their own vegetables and things, to, uh, or they go shopping, what's the first thing that they think of? What can I buy to offer? No, not the first thing is, what do I feel like eating tonight? 
what can I buy to offer? Every time that you go into the store, you think, oh, what would Thakur like? Whole well, mind gets engaged in this. It's a tremendous thing. It's tremendously helpful. We shouldn't look down upon it and the, uh, these ritualistic things done real, with real devotion. It's a, there's a big distinction that way. So, uh, Swami Swamiji used to say, the more you handle flowers, the more the fragrance will remain in your hands. <laughs> so the more we think about these things, the, the, the fragrance of it remains in the mind and the heart. The heart gets filled with these things. So, yeah, so everything that we do, this, the great thing about puja is that it's not simply the time we, we spend sitting there, but all the preparation time. And, and uh, we find that we can look forward to it and everything. And uh, uh, even those, as I say, they'll, they'll even uh, grow their own vegetables and things in order to cook. Uh, so the first thing they think of the cooking, and many women of course are like that, they'll have separate vessels and things like that, and no one can touch anything until it's offered in the shrine. The whole mind is filled with God, with uh, whatever our conception of God is, whoever we worship that way, through these things. So they're very, very helpful. Uh, if we want to be very specific and, and, and very particular and, and be like Shankaracharya and say, well, there's no direct one-to-one -one, uh, causality between that and God realization. We say, oh, so what? There's all this is changing the, the mind, transforming everything, so we reach the point where we can go beyond it. So at, at a certain stage is very, very important. Uh, Swamiji says it's the kindergarten of religion. But we don't get to go to first grade without going through kindergarten. Right? And for many people, uh, this beginning stage is a long stage. And, and this beginning stage uh, may lead us to the point where uh, that very final stage is very short. So uh, we, we shouldn't uh, look down upon any of these things because they're secondary aids in religion. Doctrines and dogmas and rituals and all of these things. Uh, they have a role to play. We should, if, if we think that this is the beginning and end of religion, then we've made a mistake, that's all. But uh, Swamiji says in one place, how can I criticize so-called image worship when my very own master attained God-realization through something? That's your own Krishna. <laughs>